Well, thank you, worship team, for leading us so well today. I'm glad for the way the, the holiday actually fell, where July 4th is actually on a Sunday. So we have all sorts of opportunities throughout the weekend to think about the, the freedoms that we enjoy in our country and also the challenges that we still face in our country. So we can rightly think about all those things because we live here, but right here in the center of the holiday, at least the way it fell this weekend, we can think about how our citizenship ultimately is in heaven. And our greatest joy is because God is sovereign and our King is Jesus Christ and He is a good, good King and is a joy to be able to serve and live under His ultimate authority. So worship team, thank you for helping us put all that together this morning. You know, from time to time, people ask me what it's like to serve as one of the pastors at Faith or you know, what words come to mind to describe our, our church family. And one phrase that often rises to the top for me is that of humble servants. This has never been flashy church. It's never been big shot Baptist. In many ways, we're just a, just a family of, of humble servants. Here's some of the reasons that I would respond that way when I'm asked. One is it's just amazing how often when I'm talking to somebody in some sort of a mercy ministry context where they tell me, oh, so-and-so has already been here. Or they've already taken care of that for me. They, they, they fixed this. They, they, they built that. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've walked away from conversations like that thinking, you know, I would have never known what that person did unless it had come up in a conversation with the individual that had been served. And then I start thinking, well, how many other acts occur like that in an average week with people who aren't doing it for credit or for applause, they just like to serve our church family. They just like to serve our community, just, just humble servants. Sometimes it's not just the person serving, but it's the, the husband or the, the wife taking care of the home or taking care of the kids so their spouse can serve. I was walking back from church family night a month or so ago, and I ran into one of our worship team members who had been serving in that role both in the, the morning and the evening services. And so I just asked um, how tiring that must be. And she quickly spoke about her husband, who had been willing to care for the children while she was away for a big chunk of that day. And I, I later thought, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I remember people like that enough. Probably in part because they don't make a lot of noise about it. Just, just humble servants that do what need to be done in, in cases like that so their spouses can actually provide more direct service to the church family. Humble servants. You know, we have a, a significant number of ministries that are, are led by staff and or volunteers that fit that same description. For example, did you know that our school is preparing to celebrate our 25th anniversary together? That's an amazing accomplishment. And some of our long-term members will remember when we prayed and worked toward launching that endeavor. Well, not only has the Lord granted that request, but He has given us a school that's characterized by excellence on all sorts of levels. And humanly speaking, that's because of so many staff and so many volunteers who humbly serve. And that's just one of dozens and dozens of seasonal and year-round ministries that we could mention. In fact, when you just stop and think about it, it's amazing how many people it takes to keep a church and its associated ministries going just in the average month. We'd certainly want to mention our deacons and their wives in this discussion. One of these months, we ought to broadcast one of our meetings just so everybody can see what that is like. And I can tell you this, I've been going to them for a long, long time. It's certainly not a power struggle between a bunch of guys with oversized egos. It's just a group of people who humbly love to serve the Lord, who humbly love to serve this church family, and you realize some of them have been serving in that role for decades, decades. 
I'd also include our other pastors and their spouses and families in all of this. You know, we have a very educated group of pastoral staff members, and a number of them are pursuing their doctorates right now. That could lead to a, a bunch of guys strutting around here like they're all that in a bag of chips. I'm glad we don't have that. By God's grace, we've been blessed with a lot of stability and unity on our staff. But when people aren't concerned about positions or titles or credit or accolades, it's amazing how much can be accomplished by people who just want to humbly serve together on a team. So, so I stand before you this morning thankful, thankful that these words describe so many people in our church family, just humble servants. Well, then we would ask logically, what makes that possible? Or more to the point, who makes that possible? Because when you think about it, you did not come out of the womb with that attitude. Is that true? You didn't start saying, hey, mom, how can I humbly serve you today? You want me to go into details here about how you were something other than a humble servant coming out of the womb? No. And think about our culture, characterized by pride, characterized by, by selfishness, the, the, the polar opposite in many ways of what I'm discussing with you right now. Well, then, then why is it possible? It's possible because we can enjoy life not in our names, right? We, we can enjoy life in, in Jesus' name by learning to serve others well. With that in mind, I want to invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel of John this morning. The Gospel of John, chapter 13. John 13. It's on page 84 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. John chapter 13 or page 84 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. I remember when we were laying out the preaching schedule back um, last November is when we typically do all of this, and I, I noticed that um, A, we were going to be in John 13 on um, July 4th, and B, I was going to have the privilege of speaking here, and I thought, I can't wait for that. I can't wait for that, because I just love this particular passage of Scripture and how it fits so well in everything that is happening um, in our country and in our calendar right now. So, so John chapter 13, or page 84 of the back section of the Bible, under the chair in front of you. Now, now if you've been with us for our study... Uh, you may know, and you certainly need to know, that we're entering into a, a new section in the Gospel of John, because chapter 12 it wound down when we read this, John 12, 35, Jesus said to them, for a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become the, the sons of the light. Then John reports this, these things Jesus spoke and then he went away. That was in essence the, the final public invitation. These things Jesus spoke and then he went away and he hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet in many cases they were, they were not believing in him. So it's at this point in the gospel that Christ is going to turn his attention to his disciples to prepare them especially for his death and burial and resurrection. We're seeing one of the earlier passages that we learned at the beginning of this study come to fruition in living technicolor. When John said he came to his own and, and those who were his own did not receive him. But, thank the Lord for the rest of that verse, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Well, the questions that are about to be clarified for us in John 13 would be, one, who really are his children? And two, how are they to relate to one another once he is gone? And the answers to both of those questions are, are shocking for sure. So please follow along as I read beginning in John 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, and I would encourage you, this, this introduction is unusually important to understanding the significance of what's about to unfold. So just think, please, about what these verses are telling us. 
But now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper. And he laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, never. Can you hear it? Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter then said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Is that not Peter right there? <laughs> boom, 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 just bouncing off the walls logically. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he washed their feet, including by the one who was to betray him, you realize that, and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, here's the great promise. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. We're talking this morning about enjoying life in Jesus' name by, by serving others well. And with the time we have remaining, let's think about four responses. I mean, what, what do we do with this? Four responses to Jesus' choice to wash the disciples' feet. And first of all, endure the, the challenge that comes with humble service. And part of the lesson of these first four verses is Christ certainly did not serve his disciples in this way because it was convenient or timely or, or easy or pain-free or because it was already a natural part of the dynamic of this group. But the challenges that Jesus is facing in this text are immense. Like what? Well, the challenge to love sacrificially and faithfully. That, that's the way the passage begins. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he, he loved them to the end. If you have been reading the book that we have recommended to you by Dane Ortland this year, Gentle and Lowly, it's, it's a marvelous book. It, it is certainly worth your, your time and attention. I hope every person from our church will read this book this year. And Pastor Ortland, Lord willing, is going to be speaking at our Biblical Counseling Training Conference, the pre-conference next February. We're really glad for that opportunity to acquaint a lot of people to him and to his ministry. But, but if you've been reading that book, it, it probably won't surprise you that he actually devotes one of his chapters to this verse. He, here's part of what he said so well. Jesus knows that this is the beginning of the end for him. Now, now think about this in light of what he's about to do. He's entering the final chapter and deepest valley of his earthly ministry. He knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world of the Father. John then pauses in a moment of moving reflection and looks back over Jesus' ministry and forward to the final week. Looking back, John says, Jesus had, had loved his own who were in the world. Looking forward, he, he loved them to the end. His ministry to this point had been utterly demanding. He had been tired and hungry physically, misunderstood and mistreated by his friends and family relationally, cornered and accused by the religious elite publicly. But what is all this compared to drowning? What is a shouted insult when you're on your way to the guillotine? For consider 
and, and that's what I want us to do right now, for consider exactly what was impending. Jesus had done his Father's will unwaveringly, but throughout it all, he knew he had the pleasure and favor of his Father. It had been pronounced over him. Now his worst nightmare was about to wash over him, hell itself. Not metaphorically, but in actuality, the horror of condemnation and darkness and death was opening its jaws. What happened at the cross for those of us who, who claim to be its beneficiaries? It's beyond calculating comprehension, of course. A, a three-year-old can't comprehend the pain a spouse feels when he cheated on. How much less could we comprehend what is meant for God to funnel the cumulative judgment for all the sinfulness of his people down onto one man? We're talking now about the, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. But reflecting on what we feel towards, say, the perpetrator of some unthinkable act of abuse toward an innocent victim gives us a, a taste of what God felt toward Christ as he, the last Adam, stood in for the sins of God's people. The righteous human wrath we feel, the wrath we would be wrong not to feel as a drop in the ocean of righteous divine wrath the Father unleashed. After all, God punished Jesus not for the sin of just one person, but what? But many. What must it mean when Isaiah says of the servant that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all? What must it be like for Christ to swallow down the cumulative twistedness, self-enthronement, natural God-hatred of the elect? What must it have been for the sum total of righteous divine wrath generated not just by one man's sin, but by the iniquity of us all to come crashing down on a single soul? Think about that, and Jesus certainly could have said at this moment, someone else is going to have to deal with the dirty feet problem, because I'm certainly about to do my part. But what was the challenge? His love was both sacrificial and faithful. He, he loved us to the end. There was also the challenge to overcome intense spiritual struggle. Jesus knew what Satan was planning to do in advance, and Jesus clearly knew what Judas was planning to do in advance. During supper, John says, that the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to, to betray him. You ever been betrayed by somebody? I think probably all of us have at different levels. You ever been betrayed by somebody? That what did you feel like doing to them in return? Washing their, their feet? It's also amazing that, that just like in 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh, you remember this passage? And he articulated that that thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, was a, remember the terminology? A messenger of Satan. So Satan's in that text too. A messenger of Satan given to torment him. But, but Satan never receives center stage, though he craves it. So, so in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that there's something that overshadows Satan. And what is that? The, the, the sufficient grace of God. Well, the exact same thing is true here. Satan is mentioned, clearly. But then he's very quickly overshadowed by something that's far more powerful, which is what? The, the humility of sacrificial service. And the apostle Peter who obviously said far more in this particular text than he should have. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Later, he's going to take up that very same topic in his first epistle. When he says this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. You hear that? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And then he says... Because perhaps he learned later the full dynamic of what was occurring here in John 13. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. See, to, to connect the first part of that passage with the end of that passage. See, proud self-sufficiency instead of humble dependence. Where does that come from? And it's possible that as soon as I raised this topic this morning, you became uncomfortable. I, I get that. By the way, did you know part of my job is to help God's people become uncomfortable? 
Did you know that? So if you're feeling a little nervous, A, I'm doing my job, and B, just wait. So, so, so I realize you might have felt a bit uncomfortable when I started talking about this because you don't like to serve God. I've had people tell me that directly to my mug. <laughs> you may not like to serve God. You may certainly not like to serve others, especially if that person has ever done anything bad to you. Or especially if that person is doing anything bad to you right now. Well, do you recognize the spiritual struggle that is going on? That's why Paul told the Ephesians, finally be strong in the, in the Lord. That's where your strength is going to come from to live this way. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Judas is not the last person who was tempted by the devil. For our struggles not against flesh and blood, Paul said, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Jesus knew that was occurring at this very moment. Then there was the challenge of believing your heavenly fathers at work. And John goes on to explain in this long introduction, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper. Many of the people in our church family I mentioned in the introduction, here's what they would say. It's a lot easier to function as a humble servant when you know how the story ends. Right? Do you think about this eschatologically? Do you think that about this from the perspective of what Scripture teaches us about the end times? And as you think about opportunities that you're called upon to serve, are you thinking about that in light of eternity? So maybe the person I'm being asked to serve today isn't that lovable, but I believe God the Father has an eternal plan for all of that. Or maybe the feet I'm washing right now belong to someone who will stab me in the back well, I, I'll leave that in the hands of the Heavenly Father who will make all things right when? In His time. I'll just do my part, find some dirty feet. I, I'll trust all the rest of that to my sovereign Heavenly Father. We sang about that earlier, remember? Do we believe it? And are we ready to connect that logically and theologically to our call to find dirty feet today? If we really do believe that He is sovereign, then we'll leave all of that up to the hands of our Heavenly Father who will make all things right in His time and in His way. Here's the point. Part of humility is leaving the final outcome to the one who knows the beginning from the end. You remember the scene in the book of Revelation? It's often called the fourfold hallelujah. Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne, this is Revelation 19.5, and a, a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you his, find some feet, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah for the Lord our God almighty, he reigns, not, not me, I don't want to be on that throne, he reigns. That there's a direct connection between the beginning of that verse and the end. So your willingness to serve God and others reveals the degree to which you acknowledge and trust His sovereign power and His sovereign hand. So, so with all of these challenges that we see in play, along with the fact that His disciples, what had they been doing coming to the, the dinner? jockeying for positions of authority in Christ's kingdom, in one case, even asking their mom to make the request on their behalf. How lame is that? Hey, mom. And by arguing about who would be greatest and then reclining at a table where they would literally have their dirty feet in one another's faces, Scripture says Jesus got up from supper. And he laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Are you letting these introductory verses have their intended effect? You realize that, that 
any excuse that we could make or any reason we could give for not serving in a particular situation melts away when we consider the challenges that Jesus was facing at this moment. Yet he didn't focus exclusively on the the tremendous sacrifice that he was about to make. He didn't brood over the treacherous betrayal that was about to occur. He didn't demand that somebody else do their part too. He got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a a towel, he, he girded himself. And I'm just asking you this morning, are you willing to endure the challenge of humble service? Secondly, expect a controversy that attends humble service. You know, one of the interesting aspects of Peter is that he was so unpredictable that he sometimes illustrated both wrong extremes in the very same event. You realize you have to be really cray to pull that one off. But but that is exactly what happened in this particular passage. So you've got those who believe that serving is nothing, right? That's the way it starts. Never shall you wash my feet, he says. And you notice he didn't offer to switch places. (laughs) He said, well, I'll do it then. No, that didn't happen. Why? To him, such an act was demeaning and unfit for the Messiah or any subject of the coming kingdom And you realize you may feel that way too. You'd never catch me doing that. Or you may have people in your life who criticize you for the way you do serve. You know, I'm glad there are plenty of people around here who don't possess this attitude. Well, serving is nothing. I'm I'm above that. This summer, I, I, I set a goal to get to each one of our properties and buildings, just to check on the maintenance, just to be sure that we're prepared for any long-term maintenance expenses that we might have, and just to be sure that for any properties that we have people living in or serving in, we're trying to maintain them well. So I've been doing a, a tour of our properties this summer, and that includes our CDC houses that um, Lori Walters and her team have been able to acquire and, and renovate and then make available to low to moderate income buyers. Many of those older homes that we purchased and renovated and now own, they're on some sort of a, a, a crawl space or a, a basement with a, a low ceiling. And so um, one day, a couple of weeks ago, one gentleman who, who rents one of our homes took me down this, this very narrow set of steps And there set a a brand new water heater. And the first thing I thought was, how did they even get that water heater down those steps? I mean, frankly, I had trouble getting me down those steps. And so I'm just thinking, how in the world did they even navigate that, that water heater down that little narrow set of steps? And, um, then then when you looked at it, the, the, the plumbing was all straight, all all professional looking. And so the, the man who lives in that house, He actually mentioned one of our CDC volunteers by name, one of our older members. And and this man went on just to talk about how impressed he was that the the man from our church cut every pipe with precision, made everything fit just right, like he was uh, installing a water heater at the White House or something. And, you know, I, I would have never known about that. Would have never known about that had I not toured those homes But see, there's just another example of one of our members choosing Jesus' view of serving instead of Peter's view of serving. So the Lord surprises Peter, doesn't he? When he says, if you don't, or if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And now you have to understand that theologically. Now we understand that wasn't simply about washing dirt off of smelly feet but symbolic of what Christ was about to accomplish for them on the cross. And that results, as it often did with Peter, just turning on a dime, right? Because some believe serving's everything. The Lord then washed not only my feet, but also my, my hands and my head. And D.A. Carson explains what he believes is transpiring here. In verses 6 to 8, the foot washing symbolizes the cleansing that is the result of Christ's impending cross work. But Peter's unrestrained and thoughtless exuberance opens up the opportunity to turn the foot washing to another point. 
The, the initial and fundamental cleansing that Christ provides is a once-for-all act. Individuals who have been cleansed by Christ's atoning work will doubtless need to have subsequent sins washed away, but the fundamental cleansing can never be repeated. S- serving's important, and Christ is going to return to that topic as he concludes this particular story, but, but the core issue is always the gospel. The free gift of salvation that is available through trusting the finished work of Christ on the cross. And there are far more applications here than we could possibly cover this morning. But let me just, let me mention a a couple that are especially important to our church's mission and philosophy of ministry. This matter of, we're not going to believe that serving is nothing, obviously. But we're not going to believe that serving is everything in the sense that it would prevent us from focusing on proclaiming the gospel. Many of you remember when we were praying for and working toward developing a campus near Purdue University. The, The reason for that is we see the fact that God has placed us in a town where there's a major Big Ten university as an incredible mission field. The fact that God is bringing so many students here to study for a period of time, and a number of them from other countries. We, we, there's a lot about Purdue that we just love. We're, we're glad that we have the privilege of having a church here. But when we think about them, we don't first think about, I wonder how the football team is going to do this fall, or I wonder about this or that. We, we think about mission, 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 mission for sure. And you remember developing property in that area is no easy feat. <laughs> we had a little opposition when all of that happened. But um, God gave us Faith West. And so I have the privilege about once a month to speak over at that campus. And one of the things I love about walking into that building, and you may not even know that this happens, but we have a large community room there, the PBF room. When you walk in there on a Sunday morning, it's filled with tables of Asian students and and family and professors who are studying English by, by reading the Bible together. Now, 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 here's the point I want to make. If you follow cable news, especially certain stripes of cable news, you know that there's plenty of discussion about the origin of COVID-19. And there are some people frothing about that issue because of the potential political points that could be scored. Right? And lost in that picture is the potential for additional racial hatred toward people of Asian descent who either live or study in our country. And that poses a very important question for us as a church. As we prepare over the next couple of weeks to begin welcoming Purdue students back to campus. See, how do we intend to position ourselves on all of that? And here is the answer, by washing dirty feet, by serving in any way that we possibly can, and then looking for opportunities to share the gospel. So you better believe we're going to continue that important ministry program to those who are trying to learn English from Asian descent. That's why we're going to continue to have the, the temporary housing program. So we're providing housing for persons who are coming to Purdue, but their housing option isn't open yet, and they need temporary housing for a couple of weeks, and many of those people are coming from Asian countries. You better believe we're going to continue to do that with joy. That's why we participate in the International Student Friendship Program. And I hope everybody here understands this. We are not a political action committee. How many times do I need to say that to you before everybody here gets that in their heads? We are not a political action committee. We care about a lot of things far more deeply than what happens in the next election. And even if that statement, and you say, I think fireworks are going off early. Good. It's not my job to make you comfortable. It's my job to help you be focused on the mission that Christ gave us. And so even if that statement is a bit controversial, realize the context, that's not the first time serving was controversial. You say, well, could you wind me up a little bit more? Yeah, let's talk about Black Lives Matter. Because I do believe this is true equally when it comes to conversations about Black Lives Matter, 
critical race theory or those who are pushing back against it in education and government policy. Those are important conversations. Those are absolutely important conversations to have on both sides of the issue, right? We believe in the freedom of speech, do we not? And so those are very, very important conversations. But I want to say this, if there's a lack of genuine serving with the goal of building loving relationships and a desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ and new life available in Him, then everything else about that just becomes background noise. That's why I'm glad that once a month I also have the privilege of speaking at Faith North. And so I was just there last Sunday. And when I was there, the church family at that location was telling me that the previous day, on Saturday, they had had three baby showers for the community, a birthday party for somebody in the community, another church's prayer service, and then a a visitation and memorial service that night for Scott Butler's father, Norman. And here's the point that I'm making to us. Wherever you locate yourself on the racial reconciliation spectrum, I want to ask you, where do the topics of serving and building genuine relationships and faithfully living and proclaiming the gospel fit into your approach? And if it's all just arguing on social media for crying out loud, or criticism or judgmentalism, but there's no washing dirty feet or addressing root spiritual causes, then whatever approach you choose is going to fall short of achieving lasting eternal change. So, endure the the, the challenges of humble service and and expect the controversy that often attends humble service. And, And thirdly, embrace the call. It's amazing to think about how one of the pairs of feet that Jesus washed belonged to Judas. And that makes all of our excuses melt away, doesn't it? Then the Lord sits back and says, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I gave you an example that you should also do as I do. And I want to ask you this morning, how are you doing in this area of life? And there's so many different layers of this conversation. So so for example, are you a servant at home? Do you wake up and start looking for dirty feet? Even if it's not fair, even if others aren't doing their part, at home, are you following the principle of John chapter 13? What about at work? And even if you're in a management responsibility over a lot of people, you can still lead in a way that serves others. Is that right? You can lead in a way that serves others. What about here at the church? It's interesting that that Peter really changed his tune on this topic, didn't he? You remember what Peter said about serving in his epistle? He said this, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And then he said, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving. Well, isn't that interesting? As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And I want to ask you, are you looking for ways to serve at our church? And I realize some might say, you know, I struggle with this area. And if someone was really honest, they might say that the pull of pride and the pull of self-centeredness is just so strong. Well, now I really have to love you as a pastor. Because that might be an indication that you don't yet know Christ as Savior and Lord. See, Jesus didn't just model this kind of life. He died to make this kind of lifestyle possible. And if you don't know that you know that you know that you're on your way to heaven, I would invite you want to talk about Independence Day. There's the possibility of being freed through the shed blood of Jesus Christ from the, the power and the penalty and someday from the presence of sin. And if you've never had a definite time in your life where you admitted your need... 
But sin has separated you from a holy God, and you placed your faith in the finished work of Christ as your only hope of eternity. I would invite you and urge you to make that decision while you have the opportunity to do so. Can I also ask you this? Did you have anybody in your life who especially exemplifies John 13? Did you have anybody in your life who that, that person is just a sweet servant of God? Can I encourage you to do this? You, you got a, a day off tomorrow, don't you? What are you going to be doing tomorrow? Huh? Well, I, I would encourage you to find some time to contact that person. Maybe that person lives in your house, and it's been a long time since you thanked them for the way they serve. I would encourage you to find an opportunity to do that. Um, Maybe it's through picking up the phone. The cell phone is free everywhere around the world now, right? Pick up that phone and um, contact somebody. Just thank them for the way that they serve you. Maybe, and I know this would be a shock to some people, they're still making over at the office supply place, they're making this thing called a pen. It's an amazing instrument, and they'll even give you some paper, and you could write a handwritten thank you note for someone who has served you in the days gone by. See, endure the challenges and expect the controversy and embrace the call, and then lastly, enjoy the blessings. Uh, There's a promise that that Jesus makes, and it's a promise that is sure, and it's a promise that is powerful. Christ said, if you know these things, you'll be what? You'll be blessed if you do them. Friends, that gets at the very core of what it means to enjoy life in in Jesus' name. And there's a lot of members of this church who would say, you know what? Some of my most joyful memories were times when I was serving in some ministry of this church. So you think about joyful opportunities over the years, you might gravitate toward the Biblical Counseling Training Conference. That's this church family serving on steroids that week in order to get that all done. We're exhausted when the week is over, but we're also what? Joyful when that week is over. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Jesus keeps his promises, huh? If you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. For some of us, when we get together with our families, We talk about crazy things that happened during the living nativity. You got any crazy living nativity stories? You should, right? (laughs) It's wild, wild to serve the Lord in that way. Or the the passion play or in uh, some particular area of serving that you've been involved in over the years. See, what Jesus promised is true. If you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do. Hey, if you still have children in your home, I sure hope you're raising them to serve. Not to just serve because it makes your life easier. Get out there and mow the grass so I don't have to. But, but you're, you're teaching them to serve so that they can become more and more like their, their Savior. At, at our last pastor and deacons meeting, we asked Pastor Tajir just to give us an update on what's going on with our teenagers, the, the kind of headwinds that our young people are facing. We wanted to learn more about that. And and how we're trying to assist parents to to raise their young people in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And part of his update included a um, recent serving trip that our young people had been involved in. I'll tell you, it does my heart well to think about a youth group that's trying to teach young people how to serve. So part of what they did during that week, you've probably heard me talk about this before, but... We learned of some children um, down around the Hartford Hub who didn't have a bed. And, and shame on me for never even thinking that that would be a possibility. That shows you how privileged I've had it. But there were, how does a young person, a, a child, wake up and be refreshed and be ready to work at school if they didn't even have a bed to sleep on? And so we were able to provide one for a particular family, some bunk beds, and then Pastor Anderson just kind of like pulling thread out of a sweater, which was more than fine for us. So, so part of the, the youth serving trip was just to build these bunk beds and then just to deliver them to different people in our community. And um, but what are we trying to do? We're trying to help our teenagers just love to serve. Just look for dirty feet. Just, just look for opportunities to serve. There were some rooms around the church that had gotten kind of messy. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Well, there's a great thing for some teenagers to do during um, their summer break. I I like that picture because many times it's best to serve not for somebody but with somebody. 
There's a lot of dignity in having somebody else coming alongside, and so we're serving together. And that was a picnic table that had been vandalized down at the, the Lincoln Park across from the Hartford Hub. And so let's just work together on getting this thing um, fixed. Or maybe it's um, serving just by playing. You say, what, you think urban kids would want to play checkers? Well, apparently. It's just all about spending time. It's all about spending time. Or you might, maybe, maybe your serving is by getting a new hairdo. And um, I didn't see the final result picture of that one. I'd kind of like to see it, but um, just serving, serving, serving. Friends, the, the application is pretty obvious, isn't it? Jesus promised great delight and joy if we would look for other feet that are dirty that need to be washed. Let's be humble servants. Father, thank you. And Lord, this is just more proof that the the Bible is inspired. Human beings would not have come up with these ideas on our own. So we thank you for a Savior who even in the face of his pending death, a hideous death on the cross for us, even while one of his own disciples was in the process of betraying him, and while everyone else in the room was too busy thinking about or arguing about their own greatness. Thank you that our sweet Savior um, girded himself with a towel and washed dirty feet. And Father, we would all confess that this is hard. We struggle with our own selfishness and our own pride. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow as humble servants. And thank you that Christ lives in us seeking to do that great work. We pray these things in his name. Amen.